Amen. How that goes along with Isaiah 61. We'll invite you to turn there in your copy of God's Word uh, this morning. Isaiah chapter 61, we're talking about renewal and restoration that is only found in Christ. Isaiah chapter 61, and we are gonna, we are gonna read that whole chapter and kind of, kind of walk back through this morning. Isaiah 61. If you'll take your copy of God's Word, your tablet, whatever it is that you're using today, and obviously just, just keep that open as we walk back, back through the, the, the text together. Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair. And they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify him. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, They will restore the former devastations. They will renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers will stand and feed your flocks, and foreigners will be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you will be called the Lord's priest. They will speak of you as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of the nations, and you will boast in their riches. In place of your shame, you will have a double portion. In place of disgrace, they will rejoice over their share. So they will possess double in their land and eternal joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and injustice. I will faithfully reward my people and make a permanent covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their posterity among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I exult in my God for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and wrapped me in a robe of righteousness as a groom wears a turban and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth produces its growth and as a garden enables what is sown to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all nations. Now Father, what a beautiful chapter we just read. What, what an incredible vision. What incredible good news that this is for us. Lord, help us to see it and savor it and share it as we go forth from this place. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, if you were to think about making a, a top 10, if you were to go home today and make a top 10 of like the best things that you've ever tasted in your life, it would be fun just to make out a list like that, right? Because you would think back to kind of where you were when you ate that meal and and who you were with when you ate it and just what that deliciousness felt like, tasted like. You know, think about this. God did not have to create taste. He could have provided for us to get nourishment without tasting anything at all, but just in his kindness, he gave us taste buds to not only be nourished, but to just thoroughly enjoy and delight in that and, and, and flavor. You know, Ray Ortland says that the, the flavor of Christianity is joy. And from the very beginning, of the announcement of the birth of Christ. When the angel comes to the shepherds out in the field, he says to them, don't be afraid for look, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The flavor of Christianity is joy and this is significant because life on this earth is hard. So many times life on this earth stinks. It's filled with a lot of pain and difficulty, and, and loss, and, 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 and grief, and conflict, and just all kinds of, 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 of trials. And this knows no boundaries. It includes everybody. It doesn't know ethnic or racial uh, boundaries. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Just in, in recent days, just 
hearing about, you know, people like Jeff Bezos of Amazon and, 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 and Bill Gates, two of the richest people in the world, who apparently behind the scenes in their private lives were going through all kinds of, of, of misery in their lives and in their marriages. This is not something that you can throw money at and make it go away. Is it any wonder that people in our world seek to escape through alcohol or drugs or porn or food or Netflix or whatever can provide some distraction to lift the burden? In such a world, truly joyful followers of Jesus have such an opportunity. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said this, as we face the modern world with all its trouble and turmoil and with all its difficulties and sadness, nothing is more important than that we who call ourselves Christian and who claim the name of Christ should be representing our faith in such a way before others as to give them the impression that here is the solution and here is the answer. In a world where everything has gone so sadly astray, we should be standing out as men and women apart, people characterized by a fundamental joy and certainty in spite of conditions, in spite of adversity. No one faced more adversity than the early believers who were so persecuted for their faith. And yet, look at the flavor of early Christianity in a passage like 1 Peter 1, 3 through 8, where Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. And notice here that the joy is grounded in the gospel. It's what God has done. It's the good news that he has revealed. And that's where we begin here in Isaiah 61 with a, a, a revealing, a revealing that we, we see here in these opening verses. So let's, let's look beginning in verse one. Look in your Bibles. The spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, if you've read the Gospels, you'll know that when Jesus went toward the beginning of his ministry, when he went back to the synagogue in Nazareth where he had grown up, he goes into the synagogue on that Sabbath day. He opens the scroll. Where does he turn to? It's this, it's this passage. It's Isaiah 61. And, and Luke chapter 4 tells us about this event. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, today as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. What scripture? Our scripture today, Isaiah 61. Jesus reads these verses, and then he says, this is fulfilled in me. 
What you're reading about here in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 is, is revealed in me, fulfilled in me. So, so let's look at it. Look at verse 1 again. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me. This reminds us of the baptism of Jesus. J- just before Jesus went, went home to Nazareth and entered the synagogue and read from Isaiah 61... He had been baptized, and what happened at his baptism? There was this anointing with the Spirit. Luke 3, 21 and 22. And when all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. As he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. What a beautiful picture here of the Trinity, right? Because the Son is being baptized. You hear the voice of the Father speaking words of love over his Son from heaven. And the Spirit descends upon Jesus. And so he is anointed with the Spirit. And it's right after this that Jesus goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, and he unfolds the scroll of Isaiah, turns to Isaiah 61, and he says, this, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. To do what? Verse one, to bring good news to the poor. Now throughout the Bible, we see that God has a special heart for the poor and the vulnerable in our world, but in the context here of verse one, and the usage of this particular word, poor here in verse one, is not so much talking about um, a lack of money. The, the word here is broader than that. It's, it's about people who are, who are distressed, people who are in trouble, people who are, are broken down by life, or maybe even broken down by things that they have done to themselves, broken by their own sin. Jesus says in Luke 5, it is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sick here means those who are are, are sick because of their own doings, because of their own sin. But, But if you recognize that, If you humble yourself and you confess that you are a sinner in need of a savior, if you're sick of your sin, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired because of your sin, then the savior invites you to come. It says in Matthew 11, 28 and following, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus has come to me. But coming to Jesus means turning from trying to make, make life work without him. It means turning from your sin and being sick of your sin and mourning your sin. Look at the end of verse 2 and the beginning of verse 3 in Isaiah 61. It says, he's come to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who, who, who mourn in Zion. This is, a, this is a mourning because of sin. It's godly sorrow. Jesus says in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. If you mourn your sin, if you're sick of your sin, Jesus invites you to come and find comfort in him. There's this revealing of good news for sinners like us. Second, there's a rebuilding, rebuilding. We see this in verse four. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the former devastations. They will renew the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Now remember the context of Isaiah. So he's he's writing here to a people who are going to be exiled in Babylon in the future. 
And he's, he knows that these exiles are going to need encouragement. They're going to be thinking that God has forgotten them, that he's going to leave them in Babylon. But this verse says, no, God's going to bring you home. God's going to enable you to rebuild. He's going to restore you. Your cities, which have been devastated, are going to be rebuilt. There's going to be this restoration. There's going to be this renewal in Israel, in Jerusalem. Now, this stands in stark contrast to what was going to happen to Israel's oppressors like Babylon itself. So we saw in Isaiah 13, 19 through 22, what was going to happen to Babylon? And, and Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms. Uh, there was, in the ancient world, I mean, this Babylon was just this marvel. A ba and Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms, the glory of the pride of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. A nomad will not pitch his tent there, and shepherds will not let their flocks rest there. But desert creatures will lie down there, and owls will fill the houses. Ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will howl in the fortresses, and jackals in the luxurious palaces. Babylon's time is almost up. Her days are almost over. What is Babylon today? Dust. Dust. This prophecy is true. What about Israel's other great oppressor, the Assyrians? What is chapter, chapter 34? What did that tell us about Edom, part of the Assyrian Empire? For the Lord has a day of vengeance a time of paying back Edom for its hostility against Zion. Edom's streams will be turned into pitch, her soil into sulfur. Her land will become burning pitch. It will never go out, day or night. Its smoke will go up forever. It will be desolate from generation to generation. History has borne out the truth of these prophecies. Babylon and Assyria are nothing but dust in the wind. Meanwhile, Jerusalem shines as a jewel today, restored. And what does this tell us? God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises. And it's not just about rebuilding ruined cities either. Let me tell you something. By his grace and power and love, he can rebuild ruined lives and bring restoration and renewal. And my friend, whatever your situation is, whatever you brought here today, and whatever things you feel like are coming apart in life, I want to tell you something. We've got a rescuer who's all about rebuilding what is broken, restoring, renewing. And God can do that in your life. Rebuilding. Third, rejoicing. Rejoicing. Let's look at verses five and, and six. It says, strangers will stand and feed your flocks and foreigners will be your plowmen and vine dressers, but you will be called the Lord's priest. They will speak of you as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of the nations and you will boast in their riches. Now, this seems strange because at first, this just seems like role reversal. It just seems like things have flipped so that the oppressed become the oppressors, but that's not what it's saying. Look carefully at verse six. He says to Israel, you will be called the Lord's priest. What does a priest do? A priest is a mediator between humans and God. A priest assists in the worship of God. A priest teaches the ways of God. And God is saying here to Israel, that is what you will do. You will be called ministers of our God. You will take on a, a, priest, a priestly role. Now, this was God's plan for Israel all along. All along, God created them to begin with to, to be what? A light to the nations. In Exodus Chapter 19 and verse 6, God says to Israel, you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. This had been God's plan for them from the very beginning. 
and one day that will be realized. Look at verse 9. Their descendants will be known among the nations, their posterity among the peoples. All who see them will recognize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. So when we talk about the descendants here, we need to see this on two levels, okay? The first level is that God is not done with ethnic Israel. In other words, Jewish people. God has miraculously preserved them through the years. God not only restored them from their exile in Babylon, but, but later on in history, in 70 AD, there was going to be another invasion and dispersion of Jewish people all over the world. And then in the 1940s, six million of them were murdered in the Holocaust. But God brought them back, right? The, the nation of Israel was declared on May 14th, 1948. And even before then, God had been bringing Jewish people back to their ancestral homeland. And then they, they, now they have a home. We talked about Yad Vashem a few weeks ago when we, when we were in chapter 56. And Isaiah 56, 5 says, God says, I will give them a memorial and a name. It's Yad Vashem. That's the Hebrew, Hebrew words for a memorial and a name. That, that's, that's, that's what the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem is. is it, it comes from Isaiah 56, 5. A memorial and a name. It's interesting when you walk through Yad Vashem, you, you walk through all the things that led up to the Holocaust, anti-Semitism through the centuries, the way that that increased in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party in Germany as the screws get tighter and tighter and then into World War II and the, the death camps and the murder the Holocaust of, of six million people, but then in the final exhibits that you walk through, you walk through the aftermath of World War II. You walk through the founding of the nation of Israel and the return of Jewish people from all over the world to their, ancest their biblical homeland. And, at the, and after the final exhibit, you walk out kind of onto a onto a, a, a balcony and you look out and you see this majestic view of Jerusalem. And the message is clear. God has been faithful. He's, he preserved us and he brought us back to the land. And what's even more amazing is that now in that land, so many are being brought to the Lord. They are seeing Jesus as their Messiah and more Jewish people have come to know Jesus as their Messiah and in the last few decades as in all of church history combined up until the last few decades. And so the stage is being set for the return of Christ because one of the things that we see in scripture is that in the end times, there will be a great turning of Jewish people to Jesus. We see that in Romans 11 and many other places. And so God is not done with ethnic Israel, right? Jew Jewish people, that's, that's part of this. But there's another level to this prophecy as well when it talks about the descendants. And that's us, most of us in this room are Gentiles. We are the Israel of faith. We share the faith of Abraham. Abraham is our father too because Abraham was made right with God by grace through faith. And so we are the spiritual descendants of Abraham, right? And we share in the promises. We have been grafted onto that olive tree of God's promises. Romans chapter four and verse 16. This is why the promise is by faith so that it may be according to grace to guarantee it to all the descendants, not only to the one who is of the law, Jewish people, but also to the one who is of Abraham's faith. 
He is the father of us all, right? Jews and Gentiles, everyone who comes to Christ. Again, uh, Galatians 3, 27 and following. For those of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Are you one of the heirs? Do you belong to Christ? You belong to Christ. You're an heir. All the promises are yours. And you'll be able to say with joy the words of verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I exult in my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and wrapped me in a robe of righteousness as a groom wears a turban and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. I heard a story about a girl who became a follower of Jesus in North Africa, Muslim background, and when her family found out that she had become a follower of Jesus, her father and her brothers beat her, they stripped her, they threw her out of the house, and so she went running through her city, bruised and bloodied and naked, until she came to the, the home of a, of a friend who compassionately t- took her in and gave her shelter. And after she rested, the next day she got up and she said to the friend who had taken her in, what are people saying? What are people, what are people in the town, what are the neighbors saying about me running bruised and bloodied and naked through the streets? And her friend said, oh, They are talking, but that's not what they're saying. They're asking me, what was this this beautiful girl doing running through the streets in a wedding dress? See, God had done a miracle. And in the eyes of the people in her city, she was wearing a beautiful, beautiful wedding dress. The church is the bride of Christ. And when someone turns to the Lord, the perfect righteousness of Christ, garments of salvation, robes of righteousness are are put upon us. It's not our righteousness, it's his. It's Christ's perfect righteousness. He lived a faultless, sinless life the perfectly righteous life that you and I could never live. Jesus lived it. And then on the cross, took our sins upon himself so that when we turn to him, we trust him as our Savior and Lord. We, we, are, we are clothed in the, in the perfect righteousness of Christ. Listen, turn to Jesus today. Let him clothe you in a robe of righteousness. Let him clothe you in garments of of salvation. Turn to him. Trust him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news of the gospel for sinners like us. We thank you that Jesus lived the perfectly righteous life that we could never live and died in our place, taking our sins upon himself, Lord, so that 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 his perfect righteousness can be credited to our account, that we can be clothed in a righteousness not our own. Father, I pray for anyone here today, anyone who's hearing this message that needs Jesus, Lord, that they would turn to him right now, turn, to, turn from sin and trying to live apart from him and turn to Jesus and welcome him into their lives as Savior and Lord and King, Rescuer, And Lord, may those of us who know him go forth and boldly and lovingly share this good news of the gospel with a world that needs to hear it. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen.